All right, Nico Skivoski from Redox is the next presenter. Thank you. That was awesome. I don't know about you guys, but doing that mindfulness practice after having coffee was a little difficult for me. I was like really trying to bring it down, but um, yeah. So that's the terrible name for my talk. It was the working title, but then I forgot to change it. Um, I want to give some context to healthcare technology. So I work in the healthcare technology space. I went to ASU and I graduated in 2009, and this is my first time back uh, since then. So it's really cool to come back. This campus was barely here when, when I left, and uh, coming back and seeing it, I'm like, this, this is not the downtown that I left. Uh, so I graduated 2009 in economics, uh, went to Boston, to Boston University to get um, more education in economics, and that's where I became obsessed with healthcare. Uh, really around the market failures that I saw in healthcare, around how like, that fax machines are the primary form of communication. Uh, why, why do doctors still have pagers on their hips? It's like the only industry keeping pagers alive. Um, clipboards, the only time I've used clipboards are in healthcare. In sports, I guess they use clipboards. But it was, it was these questions that made me obsessed about technology adoption in healthcare. Why, why 10, 15 years behind many other industries? Uh, and what, what are the things that prevent us from actually adopting new technologies in the space? So I became obsessed with that during my graduate studies and uh, wanted to go out in the world and, and understand that. So I went and worked at Epic uh, for a number of years, which is a very large uh, electronic health record company. So um, kind of the Microsoft of healthcare technology. And um, really obsessed over that problem. Okay, we have, we have this behemoth technology, but where are all the other kind of modern tech that we would expect, the things that we have on our cell phones. Uh, the, I can order a pizza from Domino's on an app and watch and come off my house, yet in order to visit with my doctor, I have to call someone and then they have to call me back and then we play phone tag and then I don't go in. Um, so we're going to get into a lot of that right now. Um, you're my timer. Okay, good. We're going to need that. Um, so. After Redox, I went and started a company called, uh, I mean, after Epic, I started a company called Redox. This is us um, probably a year ago now. Nowadays, we have about 160 people. We're scattered in 29 states across the country, so a virtual workforce. And we have a saying at Redox, uh, we're an infrastructure company. And what that means is that we're a couple steps removed from the patient. Um, so we like to remember that we are all patients. And when we think about it that way, Healthcare happens at this intersection of when a provider and a patient have an interaction. And that's an interaction, um, it's an empathetic experience uh, when the, the provider is actually trying to sit down with the patient and figure out what is going on. Where, where do these, these things that the, the patient is telling me, where do they fit within the vast knowledge of medicine and figure out a diagnosis and treatment plan? And if you think about how technology should interact with this relationship, it should really be supportive. It shouldn't replace it. It should support it and uh, help providers become more efficient in actually figuring out what's going on with patients. Uh, they should be able to do more with less. They should be able to take all the vast amount of data and determine, you know, based on what this patient's told me, it's most likely that X, Y, and Z are going on. Uh, and for patients, technology should be able to enable them to be more engaged in their care, to understand how their behaviors actually affect their outcomes. And so these are the ideal relationships that I think technology should bring, and they should really protect that, that empathetic relationship, that sacred relationship between providers and patients. And that creates this better healthcare experience. But for any healthcare providers, are there healthcare providers in the room? Yes, lots, lots, great. How many patients are in the room? It's everybody, yeah, okay, cool. Um, we know that, that this, isn't, this isn't actually what happens, right? The reality is that instead of making providers more efficient, the technology that's been adopted has actually made them less efficient. It's the one industry where technology was adopted rapidly and massively, and it's made the healthcare system less efficient. Providers spend about three hours a day on average documenting electronic health records. That's data entry sitting in front of a computer when they should be interacting with patients, right? Um, that's cutting into that empathetic patient relationship. And for patients, we haven't think should exist. Is my mic cutting out? Is that, are other people hearing that? Yeah, maybe I'll switch it up for this one.
Hello? Oh, nice. Oh, that sounds better, huh? Um, and for patients, they are fearful of, healthcare, of their healthcare system and apathetic at, at best, really. Um, you know, you hear about the, the dozens of, of instances when patients go into the um, doctor's office and don't understand what's going on, and then they get hit with huge bills, and the transparency is uh, lacking, and uh, just this utter disregard for what patients are going through in the system. And technology should be able to help with that. And what that results in is a healthcare system in our country that's fundamentally broken, right? This is like a common slide that most people talking about our healthcare industry um, points out. But that's the United States, so way on the right side, uh, spending uh, nearing $10,000 per capita uh, on healthcare every year. And of course, our outcomes in, in the country are, are middle ground at best. Um, we're approaching 20% of US GDP being spent on healthcare. For a rich country like ours, and healthcare, of course, is a luxury good, we should be spending around 12%-ish. That's what most health, healthcare economists would say. Um, and we're nearing 20%. And at what point will this, will this cripple our economy? Is that 25%? Is that 50%? We've seen this number increase every single year, at least for the last decade. Um, so there's a lot of fundamental problems uh, with care delivery and, and how efficiently we're delivering care in, in the industry. There's a study done in 2012 that looked at where that inefficiency comes from. So about a third of healthcare spending is waste. Uh, so that means that, that if we were able to, deliver, to efficiently deliver care, we could cut expenses, we could cut spending by about a third and not have negative impact on patient care. This pie chart represents the areas where uh, healthcare is inefficient. Um, so unnecessary services, excessive administrative costs is a huge huge bucket of that, bloated prices, so we have a lot of um, cross subsidies in the way pricing happens in, in the industry. Uh, it inefficiently delivered services, so you know when you have a provider who may not be operating at the top of their license, doing data entry instead of doing surgery, uh, things like that. Um, 750 billion is spent every single year unnecessarily. That's about as much um, as the entire war in Iraq every single year is wasted uh, in healthcare. And so for entrepreneurs in the space, people making technology, they can look at this, at this uh, pie chart and see it as a bullseye, really. Those are different areas where technology should be able to br come into this, to the healthcare industry and actually make efficiency gains. Because technology, if we look at the definition of technology, it's something that people use to become more efficient. So we have this horribly inefficient healthcare system that's lacking technology so why doesn't, like, why aren't they adopting new technology? Why do we still have fax machines and pagers and clipboards? Um, that's the question that I became obsessed with. And really, it's a market failure. Like, normally in a, in a, a typical open market, we see people adopt technology to b make themselves more efficient, for businesses to become more efficient, to increase their profit margins. Uh, you know, that's, that's how the market is supposed to work. So where are those market failures? I want to talk about electronic health records. Um, this was largely, th it's largely the basis for technology in, in the healthcare setting. And um, my, my, my thesis here is that electronic health records cross the chasm. Are people familiar with the chasm? It's a business schooly thing. Um, if we think about technology adoption, it typically takes like a 10x improvement of technology from when it was first introduced to when it becomes adopted by the mainstream. So if we, if we think about our, did, did anyone have an MP3 player before the iPod existed? Yeah, a couple. Like the old crappy Rio, it held 15, 20 songs, and it was terrible to get on. Um, that, if you had one of those, you were one of these uh, innovators or early adopters. But the iPod was the 10x improvement that brought the MP3 player across the chasm to the mainstream, and then everyone got it. And then, of course, it's, it's changed since then. Um, Electronic health records were invented in the late 70s. It was a database technology that was designed to help streamline the billing process. And over, but from the 70s all the way up until the mid 2000s or so, uh, we were still in the, in the early adopter phase of electronic health records. Uh, very big health systems like Kaiser and Intermountain and uh, Geisinger had adopted or built their own electronic health records, but it wasn't a mainstream thing. And then what happened in 2008, uh, the, the the High Tech Act, um, kind of associated with the stimulus package, uh, pumped about $30 billion of subsidy into the, into the economy for hospitals and providers to adopt electronic health records. 
And so it's kind of like if the government subsidized the adoption of the old crappy Rio MP3 players before we had the iPod uh, and, and really forced people to adopt technology that wasn't ready to go mainstream, that the market wasn't pulling into the mainstream. Uh, it, it forced adoption of records that were highly customized, that were really luxury type items at health, health systems, and it forced that into the mainstream by subsidizing the adoption and then subsequently penalizing providers and hospitals for not using electronic health records. So what, what was lacking was paying attention to the user experience, was paying attention to the efficiency gains that technology should provide. What was lacking was the internet. These things were invented in the 70s, and so they never really took the internet into account when, when creating the software. And I can say these sort of blasphemous things because I used to work at Epic, uh, the largest electronic health record provider out there. And the internet is not something that they were concerned with. Um, so nowadays, fast forward to today, we have about 97% adoption in the provider space, a little bit higher in the hospital space. So electronic health records are ubiquitously adopted. And that creates the infrastructure, the backbone of, of digitizing medicine. But it's so broken because they didn't take the internet into account and providers are forced to use technology that makes them less efficient. Additionally, now that we have it adopted, so uh, the past couple of years, you were penalized if you weren't using an electronic health record, um, which means that most everyone has them. So health systems have these huge IT teams that they, that they manage their health records with, and all of them are, understand the problems that I've been talking about, that it, it makes people less efficient. You can't find a provider who likes their electronic health record. So they're all trying to find ways to adopt new technologies to um, actually drive efficiency gains. But we have this, this technology adoption, adoption chasm um, because it's too hard for them to, to take new, new applications and make it work with electronic health records that they have. Because new technology is built in the cloud using modern technical ar architecture, using web development type tools and applications, whereas electronic health records are built in software development languages that are no longer su supported by the people who built them, and they are installed in the basements of hospitals around the country, and they were never designed to talk to the internet where the rest of technology is. It takes on average 23 months for a software vendor to, to go from, well, I sh flip it to the health system side, it takes 23 months for a health system to understand that they have a problem and they need a software to solve it, to actually implementing it. That's about two years of them going through a process of governance, of um, trying to figure out what to adopt, testing things out. So there's this huge adoption gap that, that needs to be solved, and so there's some big problems with the infrastructure in it. Um, my hypothesis is that healthcare really lacks this interoperable infrastructure. And what I mean by that is if we had an ability to take data from these old legacy systems and move them into a place where they can be used by modern uh, technology systems, then we could get more technology adopted faster. Uh, and if we can do that, then hopefully we should be able to solve this technology adoption problem. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how I think that can happen and how we can hopefully make healthcare data useful by providing that technology layer and um, enabling applications to, to do this sort of stuff. So I want to describe this ecosystem really quick. The past, the past, I think, seven years, we've had record-breaking numbers every single year in venture capital investment in digital health startups. There's just a ton of innovation happening right now of new, new companies coming, coming to market, bringing new technologies. Because every time we go to the doctor, you can see 10 different ways that technology should be used to make that experience better. So those people start companies. Uh, entrepreneurs in healthcare start companies doing care coordination or analytics or telehealth, remote patient monitoring, automation, all sorts of the whole wide array of digital health um, out there. And they're all built in the cloud. And in order to get their product to market, they need to work with the health systems who are actually delivering care uh, to patients. That's our stuff down below. And we'll, we'll just pick, pretend that we're this care coordination company here based on their icon. Maybe it's like a yoga care coordination company, aerial yoga, I don't know. Um, but so imagine you're that company. You have this great idea to figure out how to help patients be better. Um, how to help providers better provide care through better coordination among the care team, something like that. Um, there's all sorts of companies that are in that vein. And you finally you develop your product, you start a company, you raise a little bit of money, and you work really hard to sell your product to these health systems on the bottom here. Um, like, we, like we saw before, it takes about two years to get through that process of, I have a product, how can I get it live at one of these health systems? So I can get revenue, so I can get feedback, so I can make my product better. So. 
let's say you're one of these lucky companies that raised enough money to survive two years without getting any customer revenue, and you finally make that sale to your first health system. That two-year sales cycle um, introduced numerous costs in your business. You had to keep running for two years. You had to hire salespeople. You had to build relationships with those health systems. You had to fly there, meet with them in person, this enterprise relationship selling. Um, because of that, the cost of customer acquisition is so high that, that you have to charge so much as a company to recover that costs. So it's very rare in healthcare that we see software sold for under six figures for annual license fees, which is appalling because the apps that we use on our phones are, that are free is literally the same technology. It doesn't take more to develop healthcare apps. Sure, they have to be secure, but every app has to be secure in, in one way or another. But it takes so much more, so that cost goes way up, so they have to charge way higher prices, and we have this cost spiral. Because as prices are higher, they have to vet them more at the health system. And when they vet them more, they, it takes longer for them to buy them, so costs go up even higher. So there's this cost spiral that contributes to the lack of adoption. That's problem number one. Um, the application is now live at one health system, and then now they look across the ecosystem and say, how can we scale this and, re and repeat this across uh, many others? So they start selling to um, more and more health systems. And because of that long sales cycle, because of the IT implementation that they have to do at each one of them, they have to scale their teams um, at, at pretty much a linear rate with their customers. So every new customer, they have to add new people on their team. So the, the, the benefits of SaaS um, software scaling that we have in every other industry, it's hard to do in healthcare because you have to scale your infrastructure and your team to support it at the same rate of customer adoption. Whereas you look at things like Instagram sold for a billion dollars with, with 10 employees, you don't see things like that in healthcare because a company worth a billion dollars in healthcare probably has 500 employees um, because they have to scale like that. So we have this myth of scale uh, that SaaS doesn't work as well in healthcare. And then if you take a look across the entire industry, there's this web of redundancy because every single one of those vendors is going through those sales cycles, going through those IT projects, and having that problem as well. So that contributes to not only the inability for new technologies to get to market, but also the inability for health systems to adopt those technologies in a fast way. So that's what Redox does. Um, we sit in the middle. We pull data from health systems. We help make it so IT teams don't have to uh, do projects when they're adopting technologies, and they can adopt technology without having to go through that gauntlet. Um, but instead of talking about us, uh, well, we're, we're live at about 600 health systems across the country. We see about 8 million patient records every single day go through the platform. We standardize all of that data so that software developers can make these applications and get to market uh, and work with the health systems that they're working with. So some, you know, those are applications and health systems that we kind of sit between. But the way, ooh, look at that, transformatio. Um, <laughs> the way that a lot of health systems look at their, uh, at their technology innovation is through this thing called the quadruple aim. So when they look at adopting technology, it, it's typically to meet one of these buckets of, of areas. Um, so I'm just going to talk about some of the vendors that, uh, that we work with in the space and how they actually work in these different areas. So Gauss Surgical is um, an application that is used in the operating room, and they take pictures of anything that gets blood on it, blood on the floor, on gowns, and canisters, and sponges, and it uses spatial analysis to figure out how much blood a patient lost. Because if a patient loses too much blood, they need a blood transfusion. And so uh, we went live with them at Hackensack University Medical Center in New Jersey, and they um, basically were doing this for every, every emergency C-section that was coming to determine if uh, the mother needed a blood transfusion, because that complicates C-sections dramatically. Um, and by doing this, they were able to achieve way better results than the, the standard of care, which is like squeezing sponges and weighing rags and things like that. Um, and all, all, we, all Redox does is send the data back into the electronic health record so they can know if they need to order a blood transfusion. Um, another example is Dexcom. Uh, does anyone have a Dexcom in here? Nice. Admitting, uh, admitting in front of a crowd, I'm sorry I made you do that. Um, but uh, De Dexcom is a continuous glucose monitor. So it lives on the, the arm of a patient and sends data back to the provider so they know if they need to um, potentially intervene with care. It also, of course, helps the patient um, manage their care. Uh, Point-click care is a, a record-keeping system for long-term care facilities. So we help uh, them understand the patients that they're receiving after they're being discharged from the hospital setting uh, into an acute care setting. Suki is a pretty cool one. It is, they use a voice interface, so it um, sits in the, in the exam room and listens to what a doctor and patient are talking about, and it writes up the whole, the whole conversation uh, as a note within the record and discreetly documents everything so the providers don't have to do that. So using the new voice interfaces, the founders came out of Google for it. Um, 
So one last point here is that right now, all of these applications are being used because the health system chooses to use them. And what that means is that the authorization to, for them to have data happens in back rooms. It's, it's back office deals at health systems. Um, and that's, that's how healthcare works today. And it's, it's a shame because as a patient, you don't know that your data is being used by, by Suki or by Point Click Care. Um, all you know is that your providers are using those systems potentially. What we're seeing right now is a transition from that into a new paradigm where instead the patient should be the one authorizing the, act, the use of their care, of the use of their data. Um, so there's new regulation coming out right now that will likely drop before the end of the year that will change this paradigm entirely and actually open up way more innovation to happen. So if you're thinking of an idea of what technology could and should be built out there, instead of having to go through a two-year sales cycle of selling to a health system, you can develop it, give it to a patient, and the patient can say, I want my data going to this application so it can be used. Um, so there's some really exciting stuff happening in that front. But we'll skip that one. Um, that's how I think the technology landscape can evolve to actually make a better healthcare system. So thank you.